Hey, it's Kyle here, and welcome back to Korea Strategia, a modded, stock-alike playthrough of Kerbal Space Program's career mode. It's been a couple of weeks since the last update, just due to some work stuff keeping me busy, but we're back at Kaxa, and it's the first mission in the Umbra series, our crude MUN mission for science, prestige, and of course, the most important thing in career mode, profits. Sounds so good when you say it. So first up, we've gotten ourselves into a nice low Kerbin orbit as we prepare ourselves for our injection burn to the MUN. Bob is going to try and collect as much science as Kerbally possible on this mission, and that does mean multiple spacewalks both in Kerbin orbit and around the MUN. There's nothing massively groundbreaking here. It's all pretty similar to the missions in the previous MOF series. However, the rocket, which is currently undergoing re-entry, that's new. This is the start of our new Kerbin orbital rocket family, which we're going to call the Umbra series. Yes, the mission, the stacked craft and the lifter are all named the same thing, and I only just now realised how confusing that may be for some. But it's too late for that now. So let's break down the craft here, starting with the Umbra lifter Mark 1. The lifter component is pretty much the core part of this craft, and this design will be reappearing in future videos, evolving as we unlock those new parts such as the larger fuel tank and more powerful SRBs. This rocket will be the core of our fleet for all Kerbal system missions, and that includes the MUN and Minimus programs, satellite deployments and early space station building. Currently, it has a single skipper engine flanked by four smaller THUD engines just because of our technology. Combined, they have just over a thousand kilonewtons of thrust in atmosphere, which is still 400 kilonewtons short of the much more powerful mainsail engine, which we'll be upgrading to later on. For now, the thud engines are conveniently located in those gaps between the SpaceX style landing legs, and they're from the Kerbal Reusability Expansion mod. As always, links to the mods are in the video description. For the SRBs, we have the Pollux lifters, both with parachutes for recovery, as we're also using the Stage Recovery mod. Above the RCS thrusters, we've got a 2.5 meter service bay, which is hosting an octoprobe core, Z200 batteries, monopropellant tanks, and an antenna, along with two auxiliary fuel tanks, which have their fuel reserved for re-entry. As you might have guessed, the craft is reusable, but it's not quite able to do a controlled powered landing with our current tech, so we'll be using parachutes and ocean recovery. The next stage up is the interim propulsion stage or IPS, which has a poodle engine and then the same service bay configuration as the core stage. Its tank size is limited just due to the part count we currently have at the moment for the VAB, but it will be upgraded when we get larger tanks and splash some cash at the assembly building. The IPS also has a docking port junior on its top, which is located between the stack separator and the next stage, so it can be connected similar to an Apollo style mission for resupply as you can see here. And finally, we have the Umbralander Mark 1. This has a Mark 1-3 command pod, which fits three Kerbals, the LT-1 landing legs, a Poodle engine, and a 2.5 meter midsection from the Universal Storage 2 mod. Inside is the same things you'd kind of expect to shove in a 2.5 meter service bay with the same stats, just laid out a bit better so you can optimize the space. It's carrying science gear, batteries, and some liquid fuel and oxidizers, equivalent to one of the MRS fuel tanks you see on the sides of the craft. Again, I have a strong focus on keeping the game very stock-alike, with mostly quality of life improvements where they fit the bill, and Universal Storage has made creating utility bays so much more fun, and it's very well balanced for career playthroughs. The whole craft has just over 6,000 meters a second of delta V, which is enough to get to the MUN, land, and back into MUN orbit. And on the night of the MUN, we've arrived in orbit. And at this point, I realized I still had a lot of monopropellant left in the tanks. In fact, I had so much spare, instead of wasting our precious fuel, I decided I'd use a big chunk of monopropellant to lower our orbit a little more. And boy, did it take a while. So while that's going on, let's officially meet the crew of the mission, who we all already know anyway. Returning for his third mission and commander of Umbra One is Jeb. After Val beat him to become the first Kerbal in space and in orbit, the Kerbinaut office threw him a bone with the chance to command the first crewed landing on the MUN. In the right seat and serving as our engineer and mission specialist is Bill who is getting a lot more than he bargained for for his first mission. He thought this mission was only a flyby, not a landing, so he's freaking out. And our mission scientist is the always affable Bob, 
who happily accepted the mission for legal reasons, he's pretty excited to test some things out on the Mun. Our landing location for Umbra 1 is the southern part of the Northwest Crater, a massive crater believed to hold many scientifically interesting specimens just below the surface and also above it. Part of Umbra 1's science mission is to find a Munstone and return it home for analysis, which Bob has been put in charge of. They're also going to be deploying a suite of instruments to the surface, which they're hoping to collect a load of data from. I think that covers everything we need to touch on before the landing, so let's strap ourselves in and begin our descent. Great success. Flat here. Oh, hey, Rich. What's Astrodynamics doing here so late? Why do you mean they can't get back? I mean, I know the landing wasn't efficient, but... They're 50 kilos heavier? How, how is that even possible? You think Jeb snuck what on board? Do we have a solution? Yes, other than leaving Jeb there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, she's on call. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll talk with the team in KPL. <sighs> all right, folks, listen up. It's going to be a long night. Oh, no. Umbra One is in big trouble. This was definitely due to a very inefficient landing profile and whatever Jeb has stashed away on board. <laughs> Serious? The eagle eared among you may have picked up when I mentioned fuel allowance, I never mentioned the Delta V for the return flight because they're about a thousand meters a second short. So here we are on the surface of the bun, a mere 639 meters a second left in the tank, which is just barely enough to get us into a low mun orbit. 
So first order of business is to get these three Kerbinauts into orbit using as little fuel as possible. So we'll again be using up our excess monopropellant to help with circularization. But don't worry, this blunder won't be the end of Kaxa, as a certain steely-eyed missile man has a plan. Which means it's time to find out how our first Munwalkers are going to get out of this one. With Umbra One stranded in low Mun orbit, Kaxa scrambles to mount a rescue mission. With few options available, the team borrow a prototype rocket from KPL to stage the operation. As her friends' lives hang in the balance, Val plans for the riskiest flight of her career. Can this untested rocket bring the crew home, or will the rescue attempt doom them all? Next time, fly me to the Mun. Hang in there, boys. Help is on its way. And with another exciting preview, that is where we're going to leave it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I'm having a lot of fun crafting the story for this series, and even with KSP2 coming out this month, as it's early access, there's no career mode out of the gate, so this series will still continue on. As always, mods and any links will be in the video description below. So until next time, thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next pass.